just I wouldn't mind having some discussion about uh, Trump and Gnosticism or whatever at the front. So I just wonder if someone wanted to listen to it and and you know and and they they might hear that for a long time they might go why am I listening to this if they were primarily interested in discussion on Borges so yeah. Um, okay, three stories. The first one, the secret miracle. Um, as always, lots of interesting things to talk about. I I found myself sometimes I maybe it's because of the you know the profession that I'm in. If it's if it's a profession, you know, the, or to put it the way that you know. Aristotle and those guys have put it, the life of contemplation uh, is, is worth anything, uh, especially these days when, well, I don't know that it's been any different, but it's, you know, when there's so many calls to public action um, and that seems to be so necessary, is the life of the mind inherently valuable or is it only valuable insofar as it has a direct you know, a concrete impact on the, whatever the other world is, you know, the world of action, physical action. So anyway, that's kind of the, where I ended up at the end of the story, you know, when he spends this entire year, quote, in his head, and then the, the judgment of, seems like the implicit judgment that Borges has is that it was a worthy project, even if it was, it was not working for posterity or even for God. And so anyway, that was kind of my, I actually, I was looking up, there's a, you may be aware, there's a book called The Life of the Mind by Hannah Arendt. And I was kind of skimming through a review of that, which isn't exactly about the, that, um, she tries to make a case that the, the, the life of contemplation and the life of action are necessary for one another. But anyway, that's the sort of, you know, what is the life of the mind and how valuable is it? Those are the sort of thoughts that I found myself thinking. Yes. That makes me kind of wonder, like, what is the difference between the main character and then the character in his own book, which the character in his own book is just mad. Right. And he kind of goes through his own story and then he gets like reset back in his like present moment. And they're just like, Oh, that's sad of him. Like he's just crazy. Um, I guess like just to pose that question. Yeah. I was also really curious about exactly what that connection was. And also the sense that, there kind of seems to be two different versions of kind of um, what I'll call temporal disjunction going on here. So he writes about cyclical repetitions of time. That's what his, his, um, his artwork is about, his, the play that he writes. Or is it a play? It's like a poem or something like that. But um, so that's... That's about cyclical time. And in some ways, the character in it seems to be a kind of reflection of him put into fiction that goes through some kind of a cycle where it comes to some kind of, I don't know what you call like a breakdown or realization of some way. And from there you go from that so he's working on this this repetition but then the actual story is a kind of linear narrative until it gets to the very end in which case it then stops for a year so what is that this it's difficult to kind of see exactly how those mesh um, in the sense of you know, time going and stopping versus repetitions of time. So I, I do have kind of probably like five different answers to my own question, but at the same time, I still don't exactly know, but so that's why I'm just 
gonna throw that out there. Um, I would. I mean, I know this is a short story, and it would be impossible for any of us to be inside a person's brain as they're about to be executed. But I was taking what happened to the main character at face value. I mean, have you ever noticed that when you try to explain a dream that you had to somebody, and if you actually wrote out your dream, how many pages of text you would actually create? And it seems like in a dream, seconds, you, you, can, you can experience something in a dream that occurs in seconds that if that actually played out in re real time would have to be minutes at least. And um, this short, st this is the only short story that reminded me of somebody else. Did you ever read Ambrose Bierce's An Occurrence at All Creek Bridge? And uh, th th this had that flavor to it. And so um, it, to me, it was interesting that, that um, you know, and remember how, how does he realize that he's been given this, this additional time to, to finish his work? It's in a dream. And in, in the Old Testament and the New Testament, that's how the divine communicates to human beings. Right. You know, an angel came to Joseph in a dream and said, get you and your wife and child to uh, out of here, go, get, get them to Egypt. I mean, again and again, and again, it's it's actually one of the most recurring themes in both the Old and New Testament is is the dream world being a connector uh, between the human and the divine. And I, I just thought it was I just thought it was his prayer to God. If in some fashion I exist, if I'm not one of your repetitions and mistakes I exist as the author of the enemies to finish this drama which can justify me and justify you which I thought was oh really uh justify you I need another year grant me these days you to whom the centuries and time belong and uh, and then he has that and of course what wh where where does he where where does he go to he goes to the library Thank you, Borges. He's back in the library. Another character is in the library, sort you know, trying to communicate with God, and and so it, it seemed very Borgesian, and at the same time, I, I, it, it seemed real to me. Yeah, I would. I think this is probably my favorite story that we've read so far. It seriously blew my mind. And it has so many of his themes all tied together. So I think basically the first paragraph basically tells you just about everything that's going to happen just right there. And so it starts off with him talking about a dream where he's playing chess. And so this reminds me of the seventh seal, the, the Bergman movie. And the more I looked into it and realized like, those are extremely similar. So if you guys aren't familiar, The Seventh Seal, a movie made in the, the 50s where a knight is playing chess with death. And ultimately it it's, has all these questions about, you know, what gives my life meaning essentially? And he's basically saying that the the game playing itself in some degree offers some kind of solace for the fact that ultimately he's going to lose and death will win. And I see that too, in the sense that he's basically, I, I think this is kind of above. I mean, there's so many different dimensions. To this it, it's really incredible. It's kind of almost like a, um, how Robert Anton Wilson described um, Finnegan's Wake as a holographic text. I kind of see that too in the sense that it's kind of like any angle you look at, you can find some kind of new meaning to, to find in there. So but, but what I really see in here is a, a kind of um, metafiction about the act of the artistic process itself. And what he's kind of doing here is it's kind of like Borges writing this as the kind of author God who in writing this story 
is kind of verifying or not verifying uh basically giving a vindication in some sense of his own kind of creative power by creating something else that has creative power and it's kind of like this uh succession i guess of the ability of the things you create to create kind of beyond itself this kind of self transcendence through the artistic act that is kind of what's going on here so at the what is it like probably at the when he's talking he's he's like praying to god and, and he's where is it um never mind so okay yeah it is i think it's in his dream kind of that so yeah first of all that the part that ed read out where he's basically saying you know if i'm not one of your repetitions and misprints basically he's talking about like almost his status as like a a created thing like am i just this genre can convention that your repetition and misprint or am i basically something that has creative power myself just like you know the author does you know if you let me finish this it'll justify me and you too and the same way he's so basically the author in here he's trying to get uh a justification for his life in finishing his own creation in the same way the author god borges gets vindication by the by finishing his own creation here too if you guys see what i'm saying so basically and i think he's all about this idea of this kind of quest for redemption through art and when he goes he goes to this dream and he says basically i'm looking for god where does he go he goes to the library where there's a blind librarian there borges being a blind librarian i think later than actually wrote this but his his father was blind so he thought that he was probably going to go blind as well his father was also an author who uh right before he died wanted him to rewrite one of his stories to vindicate his life but uh yeah so he he goes to the library and base says i'm looking for god god is in one of the letters on one of the pages of one of the 400,000 volumes of the clementine so basically he's inside the books he's in the letters basically and then he goes to this somebody comes up to him and says this atlas is worthless hands it to him he ra- he opens it at random and then basically communicates to god instantly so it goes to the first one the first letter what he calls like the the tiniest one of the tiniest letters he touched a ubiquitous voice said to him the time of your labor has been granted it seems like he's talking about like textuality itself and based like this divine power almost in there and that by kind of just like connecting with the text itself through that that process there's a kind of communication with this divine creative power which is kind of like the artistic you know kind of like in whitehead the the creative principle itself as like this ultimate metaphysical principle so yeah that's that's one of the things i see in there i i really had to question myself was you know did he step into the library of babel is it that kind of scenario where in order for like the self-referencing or the fulfillment of his own life because at the very beginning it, it even says that you know he has an unfinished work and for him the character at least it seemed like this was that crisis of well my life is virtually meaningless when i look at the physical world they treat me as if i'm already dead but i feel like i have some kind of act that doesn't immortalize you know who i was that i was even here um he mentions a, a few things as far as like water rushing over him going into the dream state i think even the um uh, even the statement you know the atlas is worthless is very poignant whenever you think about the fact that he is in a library and he's asking someone who is supposed to be there to help you to help you, you know, see, find your answer, to find God, and he's saying the Atlas is worthless. And so it really reinforces the fact that he is having to create this 
divinity within himself by completing what is his life's work, literally his life's work. And it's something that the unity of time and space and how the inconsistencies or the incoherencies increased, especially like in the third act, that he hadn't really decided or determined, you know, what his life meant to him and that he was basically forced to do that in, you know, this moment of clarity. It's like the, um, I forget what chemical uh, seeps into your brain at that moment right before death. Um, Talk about, well, there's DMT that some people uh, believe, but there's also something called glutamate mm -hmm. that causes time dilation uh, when you're dying. And there's actually people that have, um, I was actually going to talk about this if we had time, uh, so I'm not going to, uh, go on too long, but basically there's this guy named Anthony Peake who has this theory that basically when you die, you basically your, your brain releases this glutamate, which causes massive time dilation and times of stress and whatnot. That's why when people get in car wrecks, they talk about it as like time slowing down. Apparently that's because of glutamate being released in their brain. And his idea is that basically you when in your dying brain, you live these repetitions of your life over and over until something kind of breaks through, basically like Groundhog Day or whatnot. But yeah, that's kind of uh, the yeah, idea there. It, it was very much like he's in his final moment, you know, his life is flashing before his eyes, but he hasn't, I guess for him, lived a life of fulfillment. And so like his life's work is finishing the story. And it's something of learning to appreciate and being present in the moment, you know, coming to terms with the fact that he is dying or he will die at the appointed hour. And it's... Uh, Thank you. Ed. Um, and I, I really feel like it's, it was very, especially like poignant um, to just kind of understand that he is having to generate his own meaning because he's basically been presented with a physical si situation saying you are going to die at 9 a.m. on March 29th and there's nothing that you can do about it. And, and his, um, I think, and I'm trying to think as far as like his dream state um, before he was trying to push it out of his mind but it just it weighs heavier and heavier until the 28th where he describes the dream state as like water deep water rushing over him and so he can't help but be immersed in that reality that tomorrow I am going to die without any question any doubt and I think that was a very powerful like invocation for him to really find that truth or search for what he is calling God and search for how he can derive meaning with his life and be okay with that because he knows that he's going to die. And it's one of those things that, you know, he, he gets the luxury quote unquote of knowing that, okay, my life ends tomorrow. And so how am I going to make my peace with that? If I can uh, follow through on that. And if you go back to the second paragraph of the short story, uh, it's when he's been denounced and now he's arrested. Um, and the, 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 the narrator says that um, he had translated uh, a book uh, in 1928 and the fulsome catalog of the firm had exaggerated the translator's reputation and, uh, and it had been examined by, I don't know, would it be Julius, I don't know how to pronounce, R-O-T-H-E, would it, would it be just with a T, Rote or Rothe, Rothe? Um one of the officials who held his fate in his hands. And then this, this sentence, I think, is Borges will do this. Borges will state something that is, is very, very true about the human condition embedded in a story that's not about that necessarily. Look at this sentence. There is not a person who, except, except in the field of his own specialization, is not credulous. Two or three adjectives in Gothic type were enough to pursue, persuade Julius of Haddock's importance, and he ordered him sentenced to death. And to me, think about it. This author is being condemned to death because a security official, internal security official, thinks he's more important than he is. Think about the, the, like think of the irony. You know, he and he it, and it seems like it's it's the man who's going to die realizes. He's not that important, or what he has produced is not that important. He's not that uh, uh, important of a figure. So to rationalize, how do I phrase this? To give meaning not only to his life, but to his death, it seems to me, 
he wants to make good on the promise of his unfinished work. So his, 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 he, he, he wills himself to finish it so that his death does have some meaning. You know, an odd thing about that, though, is that 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 meaning doesn't depend on anybody else knowing about it. And right. so, you know, I mean, I think you often hear people talk about wanting to leave a mark or, um, you know, striving to create something that will last beyond them um, or create a memory that will last for a very long time. Or, you know, people talk about their children being their, you know, what they leave, you know, they have these great kids and that they will go on. And um, what this guy, he doesn't leave anything. And so in terms of constructing meaning, um, I just think that's an interesting way to end the story is that the only person that knows that he has created this thing is him. You know, one thing this reminds me of is Heidegger's idea about death as kind of the source of, of our meaning in life in the sense that by being given an actual, you know, into our narrative, you, you see basically that there's ultimately going to be some kind of a unitary story, I guess, of you, some kind of synthesis of time that makes sense and that only happens if you have ultimately this kind of end and i think there's something like that going on there that basically by reflecting that you know that his life is going to end that's when you start thinking about well what is the point of this you know what is all this amounted to so that gets some thinking about that but then on top of that um you know, Heidegger also talks about death as one's own most in the sense that, that no one else can die for you. And that's why he sees it as a kind of um, something that can bring authenticity and kind of an individuation because, you know, you can have people basically think for you a lot of the time. You can believe basically whatever from, you can get all these things from the culture uh, you know, the, the they self, the anonymous they self, and you pick it up from the crowd, but ultimately you have to be the one that dies your own death. And ultimately your life is your own. That's defined then by your life that's defined by your death. So I see that as kind of something that, that is a, ultimately focused on this kind of individual aspect of it all. In the sense that, yeah, he, because I think what he's saying there is that it doesn't really, yeah, it doesn't matter. I'm not doing this for, for something else beyond, you know, it, whether it's God or, or other people to listen to this or whatever. Uh, I'm simply doing it to give some kind of meaning to my, the own narrative of my life now that I'm going to die, clearly, soon, possibly, maybe in a year or a day or two minutes or whatever. Here's a, th a thought that uh, seems probably not what he means, but I'll throw it out there anyway, because uh, it popped into my mind. You know, so what what gives life meaning? Um, and again, often what we want to do is set our people want something that's going to outlast them in some way. Um, but this, at the end of this, story all of this stuff happens you know in a moment in a sense i mean it, it it's a it's a year is it, is it a year it's a year for him but really it's you know it's a moment in time and so the entire meaning of his or the the fulcrum of the meaning of his life is sort of content, condensed into a single moment um you know it has this dilated character to it but then, in, you know, earlier in the story, he was uh, talking about this thing that I used to do when I was a kid where I am, if I could imagine the worst possible thing that would ever happen that it can't possibly occur, 
I used to run these scenarios in my mind all the time. Um, mm -hmm. But they, that there seems to be, you know, there's sort of an intensity of experience. And it's almost as if, like the way he describes it, it's almost as if he's living through those moments in reality, you know, because of, because of his intense imagining of them. Um, and, you know, you've probably heard stories like there's some kinds of trauma that apparently activate some of the same brain centers as actual experience. So you can have some sort of emotional trauma that is as intense as if you had this. And I, again, I, I, this seems like maybe not, but that there's something about if, if part of what the story is about is how do you find, how do you vindicate a life that is a tiny speck out of a tiny speck out of a tiny speck of a, of a temporal frame, you know, that maybe part of it is that the meaning is in the moment and somehow, and in the way that you sort of can interpret each moment of your life as having a, some sort of ultimate meaning. You know, so this guy didn't do it till the end of his life, but it, it opens the possibility of having some sort of, I don't know if he could do it all the time, but of, of finding ways to find what's happening in the moment and exploring it deeply and finding a, a deep sort of meaning in that without having to necessarily, you know, leave some great work or something for posterity because you know in the in the as they say in the grand scheme of things that's going to go away too you know eventually all those people that know you will die and even if you're someone like you know jesus christ or caesar uh eventually the whole planet's going to be gone and so you know in the grand scheme of things nothing's good i think that you know it's probably one of the attractions of having a a belief in an eternal domain is that nothing goes away like a friend a friend of mine uh, who, when I was interested in Christian mysticism, he used to say that one of the functions of God was to maintain a memory of everything that has, has ever happened. And so that in some sense, I guess that's a kind of redemption, you know, that the, that God remembers every moment of every life that ever has been, or, and, you know, that will ever occur. And so this, this, it, there's a sort of vindication in that the, your existence persists forever for eternity in the mind of God. But if that's not the case, then in some sense, there isn't any vindication in the sense of what makes my life meaningful. Well, there isn't anything really, unless I can find it meaningful here, or, you know, or as, as Chase said, construct some sort of meaning for it here. I, I, I think that like the, the defiance is an important part too. Like, I think the, kind of him not being able to create this entire like create this book or, or, or drama or whatever his entire life and then suddenly he's being surrounded by kind of these unconscious uh like non-creative beings that that like clearly julius roth doesn't understand his contributions or what he's trying to do in his life and and none of these people do i mean it describes uh at the end of like the second paragraph uh, this delay was owing to the desire on the authorities' part to proceed impersonally and slowly after the manner of vegetables and plants, which actually makes me think of like Bergson. Exactly. You know, being, yeah, being unconscious, you know, and not having kind of a desire to create something and develop. And then later he talks about, then he reflected the, the reality does, that reality does not usually coincide with our anticipation of it. With the logic of his own, he inferred that to foresee a circumstantial detail is to prevent its happening. So I think that that's another thing, like he's starting to recognize these things about his ability to create, but only under this kind of uh, idea that he's going to die and that the people around him are going to kill him for really no reason at all. You know, like the, the fact that not only does meaning not exist in this, but also the people, like the people who are doing this aren't finding meaning in it. You know, they're, they're just doing it because they're being told to do it and, and because it's easier. Yeah. And so there's kind of this, this thing where he in defiance of this kind of thoughtless uh, death creates something, 
you know, and I think that in a lot of ways, I think Jorge sees probably the situation he is in and, and the things that he's had to deal with as an opportunity for him to create something that, you know, not a lot of people can create who are in situations where they're kind of being forced to just be detached from themselves, do what other people are expecting them to do and, you know, be as emotionally distant from that as possible. So another angle that all this kind of made me think of is so one of another one of his big themes is this, this kind of paradox of the the whole and the part or and what is the relationship of those things you know the the one and the many or the the temporal and the eternal these kind of relationships so i think one way to possibly see that that he is kind of gaining some kind of um meaning or justification through that kind of, uh, you know, that uh, kind of persistence and some kind of transcendent memory or, or something like that is, so he, in the way that he talks about in the dream of the library, he goes to the library, I'm looking for God. God is in one of the letters on one of the pages on one of the, these volumes. He goes to the first one and sees it. That seems to indicate that if God is in just one of the letters, you know, what are the attributes of God? God is, you know, eternal, infinite, omnipresent, all these things. It seems to be saying that basically in just the small atomic unit, the part, the whole is present there also. So that's why I see this is kind of like holographic in a sense that um, if you can see that basically one thing reflects all things kind of like a in a hermetic philosophy and whatnot it would it's uh the idea of the microcosm and the macrocosm that the the microcosm the smaller world in some sense reflects the larger world the macrocosm so i, I think that basically in a way saying even the, the smallest act of you know defiance or creation can kind of have uh, a kind of refraction through everything in a sense. And I see that as a, and also there's this whole idea that's connected with that uh, of alchemy of basically trying to kind of, you take ingredients of something and you try to sublimate them and combine them into something that's greater than the sum of its parts, essentially. So it'd be like taking something that's meaningless these thing, these you know, stupid acts of of barbarism and culture, you know, the Nazis and whatnot, and trying to kind of create some kind of synthesis of meaning out of that through this creation. And I think that's kind of what the you know, al okay, so alchemy is basically, you know, uh, in popular sense, it's turning base metals like lead into gold. And you can also see it as a metaphor, basically, of the creative act also. And it's in the sense that he's taking these elements of his life that maybe have no meaning in themselves or, and are disconnected and whatnot. And by putting them together, it kind of sublimates them into something that can actually reflect that transcendent element of what it's not. So the temporal becomes eternal in some sense. The part becomes the whole. And, you know, he talks a lot about how, you know, the thing from Schopenhauer, one man can become all men, in a sense. I can see that as something that's going on there. And that, so I think ultimately what he's kind of trying to hint at is that there's some, he's, he's trying to grasp some aspect of eternity here, whether it's through repetition or, or something. And it, it's like this, this confrontation with, just that the imminence of time and of death while tr trying to, to grasp onto some kind of vindication through vindication of eternity, the name of his book, that there's something there that is kind of essential to this kind of alchemy of meaning or whatnot.
I'm reminded of um, when I was thinking about the function of poetry years ago. I mean, I, I, not that there's a single function, but uh, Chase's comments reminds me that one of the th things I thought about is that um, poetry can give you the ability to to look at the difficult, the horrific features of life, because um, because when poetry is beautiful, it you know the poetry itself is beautiful if it's if if the poet is is masterful, and so you know the use of language and the use of metaphor and so on is has this beautiful character to it, and yet. allows poet or different and somehow the um, the poetry the art artistry of the poet of the poetry itself sort of redeems in a sense the the horror of the exp what it's expressing and um, that's not exactly the same thing but in this but in the sense that being you know expressing something in an artistic form I don't know, this seems related to that notion to that notion of the myth that I was throwing around a while back that, you know, we necessarily live in myths because we have to, we need, we need meaning. Uh, the idea of my life just being a disconnected set of factual occurrences is sort of the definition of a meaningless life. It's just a bunch of shit happening. And so you have to construct some sort of way of interpreting it. I there, I can't remember there was a quote from Nietzsche that I used to throw around, but I think one of the reasons, that's one of the reasons Nietzsche thought art was so important. So I think Nietzsche says that um, life is aesthetically justified or something like that. Yeah. I think it's something like that. Yeah, and that's the kind of thing I, thing I was thinking about that, the, you know, the art has this, I was telling, trying to tell this to my daughter years ago when she was, stu when she was studying art and everyone was, was beating her up for why aren't you studying something that's useful. And, you know, my view at that developing the time was that art is, you know, perhaps the most essential feature of, of human culture because it is exactly art broadly construed that actually lends meaning to our lives and you know really broadly construed religion is an aspect of that as well as what you traditionally think of as arts but it is through art that you know we have this conscious being who reflects on things if you if you think too much like we do it's not that hard to reduce life to a bunch of meaningless facts you know and it's even easier today than it's ever been because of the advance of science and so art becomes even more important because it is art through art that we can provide interpretations for ourselves that grant meaning and value and structure to, you know, to these sort of re re reductionistic lives. And so, I mean, that's a, at a much higher level, but so, than what maybe the story's working at, or much more abstract level, I should say, but something like that, you know, where he's trying to construct, a, and you know, like, I forgot who it was that was Alex or someone, or, and I can't remember, maybe it was Travis was pointing out, you know, the, the books that this guy's spent his life writing are pretty obscure. <laughs> you know, for most of us, they're these books on, you know, Jewish history and, you know, the Jewish this and Jewish that, you know, these sort of little obscure things. And so, you know, across even the scope of human research and literature, it's a pretty damn narrow sliver and and yet he has to find a way to I don't know what redeem means maybe but redeem here seems to mean make this meaningful you know make this make this life having been worth you know why was this life worth living anyway yeah I, I definitely agree with that and since I I think I don't think that's over reading this or anything like that is I mean I think it's almost impossible to do especially for for Borges, but I see um you know I see that a lot in uh, I think especially film where people can show something but it's a way of kind of showing it in a different way that's kind of um, 
displaced from our normal cognition of things, which I think is usually a kind of like a social moral kind of frame where we're constantly judging things as basically, is that good or bad? That's it. Good or bad. And one of the things about art is basically it can take something just completely mundane or something awful and just by dislocating it into something else makes you suddenly look at it in a different way. So, you know, um, what's his name? Uh, uh, the, uh, the French Dada guy who made the fountain basically, you know, took a, uh, a toilet. Duchamp. Yeah. yeah, Duchamp, yeah. Duchamp. And um, basically it's like, what did it put our mutt or something on it? Like, this is art, you know? Basically the dislocation of it produced something that made people think like, well, what is going on here? You know? And I think from that you have to, there's something like that going on. And so also the, uh, the sources that he talks about, I think these are really significant. And okay. So Jakob Burma, he was a uh, kind of, he was German, I think in the, 14th century, something like that. He, he's actually been called the, uh, by Eric Davis, the most Dickian of mystics, as in Philip K. Dick. And he had this, uh, he was a cobbler, he made shoes, and he had this experience of seeing basically light reflected through a, a puddle of water or something like that. And then from there, suddenly had just this uh, revelation about the dialectic processes of the Godhead and basically created dialectics. Actually, Hegel got dialectics basically from Burma. And uh, he, w he was very involved basically in this whole kind of hermetic alchemical basis, it, which I think is very significant and that alchemy is exactly that aspect of art that can basically take you know the the most crass things in life and do these processes and these combinations and these dialectic syntheses in order to create the philosopher's stone of gold of the eternal of perfection of the divine in some way so it's basically this process of like how do you take you know that which is essentially not divine profane and turn it into something sacred or something that is, you know, disconnected, temporal, you know, limited, worldly, and turn into something that's somehow transcendent. And that synthesis between those opposites is kind of what's going on in this in this kind of redemption through art. Yeah. Um, something I wanted to ask was why does this last piece of work, how does it differ from like the other stuff he's done? And why, why is it the redemptive piece while the others are kind of just, as he says, like on one paragraph on like the third page, he's kind of like comparing. Yeah. Or he's talking about some of the past art he does and he says it's like uninspired. Uh, right. I guess just wondering what the difference there is. Why is it, this one sp so special? It, it's the paragraph that starts out. Um, is it, Haddock, how are you? How are you mentally pronouncing this man's name? Do you pronounce the H or the L? <laughs> yeah, I try to like blur him, but yeah, it's the one that starts with Fladdock at yeah, rounded, at rounded 40. forty. And he says the the problematic exercise of literature constituted his life, and then it you know we're mere he just the the first three works his studies of the work of these three men had been characterized essentially by mere application. And I thought I, that was somewhat vague to me, but his translation uh, by carelessness, fatigue and conjecture, vindication of eternity perhaps had fewer shortcomings. But it's even, I found it sad because the word perhaps, you know, he couldn't even say, it had fewer shortcomings and perhaps it had fewer shortcomings. So there's this grudging, grudging uh, acknowledgement of the worth of these uh, pieces of literature. 
and then um and then it it seems to me that it was his vindication of eternity is what led him in his thinking to come up with the idea for his drama in verse the enemies and in some ways i was just thinking that one of the reasons why he may have thought to himself that this was a vindication or a leg uh, making his life legitimate or have meaning is that no matter how haphazardly and limited he had been working through certain ideas that the enemies was a culmination of all of his thought and writing that this was going to be the, the in 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 the best form of um that he could come up with to explain his ideas about time. Yeah, I think the idea that in some way it's kind of a, a, a culmination of his writing and also something that kind of, I think what would ultimately give it some kind of a special status as, you know, giving it vindication uh, versus the others is the sense that well these other ones they seem kind of impersonal you know like one is a translation you know or they're about someone else's thought and ultimately this one the enemies is basically his own kind of thing it's his own creation and i think to a certain degree that's significant but so i was reading um some of this uh the Cambridge Companion to Borges, and they talk about, so he has a, these works where he talks about, you know, what is the point of art in these things? And that was basically seen to be his big idea about like literary theory for especially the, what they call the early years was that it could be a kind of redemption, but then he started to kind of question this idea and it seems like uh, here it's kind of, he's kind of already supposedly past this phase of looking at literature as redemption and where he's now looking at it as, as something, uh, what do they call it now? Basically as an active prism in which fiction creates an autonomous sphere in which experience is refracted through the feeling and imagination of the author as a kind of expressive function. So there's something kind of expressive of it, yet that is a kind of prism that refracts some aspect of the author's life in it. And I think that's really what's going on in this one that kind of makes it special is that in some degree, the play that he writes is, has his own life refracted in it. So this is also kind of the part whole paradox thing again, and that, but okay, so basically this person in in his play, you know, goes through the, these various things and it is kind of caught in this cycle of time and repetition and whatnot. I, I think that's very significant. I'm not sure exactly how it connects though. I, I know there's some uh, some way that basically this character in his play reflects basically what is going on in the story with with the uh, the main character. I'm not exactly sure how, but I think in that connection, that's probably where you're going to find that vindication that separates it from the other works that he's made. Yeah, I think it was it was kind of my understanding that what made that piece more important was its kind of defiance. And, but that I think kind of agrees with what you're saying, because I think that in the play, in this character, uh, time in a way, I mean, maybe not necessarily doesn't exist, but he, he's like immortal in a sense, you know, I mean, if he's constantly reliving and living his life endlessly, then he has infinite time. And that's kind of what Pl uh, Plodic wants is, is infinite time is to be able to have more time to complete this. So yeah, I, I think it agrees with what you're saying, but I also think there is this element that, you know, like he, he didn't realize that the enemies would be his redemption until after he already kind of started it and created it. 
And I think that in this context that he's now in, it makes even more sense that it's his redemption because it's his last thing and it, it's something that he can finish and he just needs a little more time. So, yeah, so I, I think in, in the same way that when you create something, you only really are able to see what, what its meaning is after it's been created. You know, the process of creating it is, is this, is much more complicated. You know, you can't really understand it while it's happening in the same way that, you know, while we're our present moment, we're never really fully understanding. We're just constantly kind of understanding the past. So, yeah. So I think that, yeah, in a way he's trying to defy this, this death through his art, which also happens to kind of show the way in which he wants to defy his death by having more time. So, yeah. Well, uh, look at the I paragraph. Get, um, the next paragraph. Oh, I'm sorry, Joey, you were gonna say something? Yeah, I was just gonna maybe like challenge that a little bit, um, thinking that like what exactly happens in his story. Um, and maybe, I mean, it does say he like finishes it, maybe he like changes it, but I'm, I'm thinking like his, the character in his story is, seems to be mad, stuck in a circular delirium, um, right? Maybe he's reliving something over and over, but like, it's almost any he, like he's resisting his death, right? He's he's kind of afraid of these people who are going to kill him. Uh, he kills somebody as a, in a defense. Um, I'm wondering if there's anything that can be said about the narrator, or, um, Ladik, and how he kind of like accepts the fact that he's going to die and he brings his story to an end. He finishes his work um, as opposed to kind of like resisting death and trying to put it off and trying to imagine all the possibilities that could like save him um something that i found kind of interesting at least to lend credence to the defiance aspect of it was mostly him um the line he came to feel an affection for the courtyard the barracks and then one of the faces before him modified his conception of uh, rummerstadt's character and so he's literally using one of the, I'm assuming, soldiers that's going to kill him as some modification for his story and incorporating that into the work. And so for me, I think like it it kind of lends a little bit of credence to that defiance aspect of it, of, you know, utilizing, coming to terms with his surroundings and what's happening and even using the face of of one of his would-be, you know, murderers um, in in his life's work. And I think that that's, it, it, pulls him out of the character necessarily being um, a personification or insertion of himself into his own life's drama and takes him outside of that. And I think that that's something um, powerful or something very interesting, at least, whenever you think about about how he's formulating the story. Are you meaning to say that he's differing himself from his main character in that? Uh, yes, I, I I think so, um, and that maybe the initially whenever he first started writing the story, when it it was kind of more formless and circular and incoherent, that it was a device of him uh, inserting his own frustration with what he was doing and his own satisfaction, and and differing himself um, and really attributing or making the modification of of the center of this epic that he was writing that he is able to step outside of himself so that he can complete his work yeah i I agree with what alex was saying that's kind of yeah yeah i think in the over that year in the process of creating it i think he changes and i think he decides that that he did he doesn't need to live infinitely you know he's accepted kind of what he's created and, and and ends up being satisfied with it. But I think leading up to that moment, what he's obsessed with is this extra time. And, and he, he doesn't expect it to be, to come in the way it does. You know, he doesn't expect it to be just him being paralyzed right before he dies for a year. You know, originally I'm sure he expected to be able to write and to actually live another year. So I think that almost kind of again, another act of defiance against the fact that, oh, I can't write, oh, I can't, I can't actually finish this and materially. And he has to work around that as well. But, you know, eventually, by the end, I think he has this final kind of understanding of like, you know, the work has changed, I have changed. And overall, the process of creating this is what allowed me to believe that my death was meaningful, despite its meaninglessness. Yeah, if you look at the paragraph 
uh, after the paragraph that Chase talked about where it lays out the plot of the of the drama in verse. It's the uh, second sentence of the next paragraph. He felt that the plot I have just sketched was best contrived to cover cover up his defects and point up his abilities and held the possibility of allowing him to redeem symbolically the meaning of his life. So I, I do think that the main character, that the enemies became more important to him the closer he was to actually being executed. And remember, it's the night before his planned execution that he, uh, that he prays. He spoke with God in the darkness, right? And he asks for the year. I need another year. And, uh, and then the dream happens. So, yeah, I think this is, uh, I think this is a way of a vindication of himself and of his life and death. And if we can take it at face value, it, it probably was better. He, this, this was the best that this work ever could be by the time he was done. Uh, I did want to, and maybe along that last thought you just mentioned of wondering what, what is the significance? Cause I like have it highlighted, but I didn't really know what to make of it as like, it's one of the last sentences of the story where he says something about the wearying cacophonies, cacophonies that bothered Flaubert so much are mere visual superstitions, weakness and limitation of the written word, not the spoken. I uh, don't know what to make of that, but is that referring to something about like a, a strength that his story has and that it's not an actual written story or in the world? Yeah, that, that's what I took it as. And I, and I think that perhaps it could have never existed as a written story. You know, it, it wouldn't have the meaning that it has to him as a written story, as something that was appreciated or understood by other people. You know, I think that that's valuable. Um, <clears throat> I think uh, something that's kind of, that comes to mind for me that's important uh, is that I think that by the end, I kept thinking, I was like, okay, what if, what if he didn't meet God? What if he's a crazy person who <laughs> didn't meet God and wasn't given a year of, it, of time in freeze time to think of a play? What if that didn't happen? What if perhaps, and I thought, well, b based on the way that it's orchestrated, like exactly based on what you just said, that, that, had he really tried to flesh it out or do what he, I guess, sort of thought was happening in a, I guess not really. If he tried to make it explicit, if he tried to use this year, this year of mystical time to actually write a story, it would not function as the, the like what he initially wanted it to be when he started the journey. And I think that because of that and a series of the other kind of pieces that are coming together, like the necessity for God, the necessity for the, for the killers, even though they're the things destroying the, the mission itself. I think that, I think that, uh, sorry, somebody just knocked on the door and I, uh, my train of thought has changed, but um, yeah, I completely lost it. Excuse me. I'm going to check on what that happened, what that was. Okay. Tell them to go away. Yeah, don't worry. It's okay. I know. Yeah, I was. Yeah, it's okay. So it's it's almost three thirty. I'm wondering if we want to talk about the others. Um, Chase looks like you had a, you were trying to say something. Um. This is another one I I could talk about it in a lot of different ways, but um. I'll. Yeah, well, let's just go ahead and move to the next one, I guess. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll leave that for, I don't know. Maybe when I repeat this in my dying brain, I'll, I'll think about this moment when I could have added this, but I didn't. So, but eternal regret or, I don't know, maybe I'll, I'll find some kind of vindication and accepting that would, I never it mentioned It would be this. imperfect. It would be imperfect if you told it to us. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, I have a, uh, oh. a, a, tiny, a tiny piece of trivia on the three Judases, three versions of Judases. Um, on the second to the last page in this edition, it's the 
well, if you count the little tiny paragraphs at the end, it's one, two, three, fourth paragraph from the end. He mentions um, a theologian called Hans Lawson Martinson. Uh, that guy was one of uh, Kierkegaard's dissertation um, faculty and someone that Kierkegaard spent a lot of time railing against in publications in his lifetime. So interesting little, little bit of trivia. I doubt if, uh, I doubt if, if Bohr has put that in there by accident, he's probably, there's probably little Easter eggs all over the place. That oh, yeah. miss. Anyway, so if anybody has any place to start, go right ahead. Well, one thing that I think is interesting in here is, um, Okay, so it's basically about this alternative view of Judas to the, you know, the orthodox view. One thing that's, that I think is, is kind of interesting is that they did find a Gnostic gospel of Judas that wasn't translated until like 2007 or something like that. Um, uh, there's some kind of, there's basically a controversy over whether it presents Judas in a favorable light or not, where I, I think it's kind of interesting because it goes back. So basically they thought at first, because of possibly some kind of uh, motivations for sensationalism, like National Geographic were the first people that were in charge of basically translating this text and doing a show about it and they wanted to present Judas as a uh, basically like a good guy. And then eventually people are like, well, actually that's not exactly correct. They're basically saying in it, he's a demon he, and, uh, and whatnot. And they showed all these different translations that kind of contradict that. And it kind of goes again, it kind of goes with the kind of this quote in here that kind of sets them off of, not one, but all of the things attributed by tradition to Judas are false. So I think that's interesting that it's basically like no matter how you try to kind of pin them down, ultimately it's false. Because Judas is, uh, you know, he's like the, he's some kind of transcendental signifier that, that goes beyond any kind of... Uh, kind of meaning you can try to attach to him in a definite way. He's something beyond that. Well, if it, I've read this story a lot of times and, and the difficulty of Judas is if, if the meaning of Jesus is the resurrection, right? If the whole idea of dying for our sins, well, then he had to be killed. And if he's, he's a non-Roman citizen in Roman Palestine, that means he's going to get crucified. And so his resurrection is, is dependent upon his death, his execution. His execution is dependent upon the Romans being concerned about who or what he is. And so that's how I viewed the first version of Judas out of the three, where it's basically, you know, this uh this wholly made up author uh <laughs> I, I love Boris creating these these non-existent authors to put forward his own uh i think sometimes ideas runeberg um and uh the first version is basically judas is as actually extraordinarily important because he helped the 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 crucifixion and resurrection of jesus and that he viewed Jesus as the Godhead, as being, you know, one of the three in the Holy Trinity. And so without Judas, you don't have the redemption. You don't, you don't have this, this cosmic sacrifice, right? Almost like in, in logical, historical terms. Yeah, and at the end of that section, um, page 97, it says, Judas in some way reflects Jesus. I really like that line because I think it's like, yeah, it's like without Judas, I think that it would be harder to see the value of Jesus. You know, he's kind of like a, a mirror, like reflecting or, or refracting or whatever this idea and, and extending it. 
and so yeah I see his his place in that is really important and I've always kind of seen his place in that is really important and it's always been a question in my mind as someone who used to be uh, religious of kind of what like where Judas's place is and and like why if he was so important i feel like this is a question that i never had answered it's like why if he was so important did he have to like hate himself and, and commit suicide and, or whatever that reminds me of i don't know about how many people here have uh seen jesus christ superstar yeah, yeah that's yeah jesus christ superstar is an old play uh it's really good but um uh, as a part of it there's a part at the end that i'm thinking of specifically the, the whole play revolves around judas in this light of pretty much the first he, he pretty much thinks like i think of the first the first depiction of judas this sort of very important cog in the great machine causing the sacrifice causing the, the the resurrection you know he was a part of the process but it's a very sympathetic story but at the very end judas is dead he's post suicide and he is speaking to jesus and he says jesus why didn't you why didn't you come to some other time why did you show up in this horrible reactionary nightmare town in the Middle East where you're going to get killed? Why didn't you show up in the middle of um, social media and like, not, you know what I mean? Like, like why didn't you, and there's TV broadcasting and, and shit. Like, why? This seems like it would be way more productive to show up later than to get killed and be a legend some, sometime deep in the past. And he says, oh, because you know, not, like all, all of the contingencies that came together were necessary, including you, Judas. Like, like I, I came there because you were there. You know, you and everybody, everybody that I love and everybody that I needed to be there were all right there at that right moment of time. And so it, that first view of Judas, it kind of, it puts, it puts everybody into this trap around Jesus. This like, this, it's like he's this, this whirlpool of determinism that all the people around him are, are just pieces of the puzzle falling into place for God's plan of, 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 this transaction that's going to happen where he's going to redeem everybody by paying the ultimate price or something. You know what I mean? Which is why I, I just, by nature, I like, I kind of just reject that first reading of Judas kind of entirely. Uh, like just based on, just based on that, I think I, I already, and I, and I refer to Baidu, Alain Baidu, who was a French guy um, on that notion that I think that the transactional notion of um, the redemption should be kind of revisited or, or kind of rethought, restructured, or perhaps altered in some way. But I don't really know necessarily what, because they have a ton of crazy theological arguments that I do not understand at all about what the real redemption is uh, and yeah. like like the, how redemption is in the community of believers or whatever. But um, yeah, that's just, that's what I'm thinking about that first, that first depiction of Judas. I, I think that's what I'm immediately reminded of. So one thing that I think is interesting is, um, you know, the whole idea of a kind of teleology where Jesus' crucifixion, everything is basically subsumed to this one goal, and therefore everything is kind of given beforehand, like uh, like Bergson's critiques of, of finalism. He says basically, you know, if something is given as a, this ultimate endpoint then it's pre-given right there so so what does that do for free will exactly because basically that's how theology has to operate um i mean of course there's different theologies that would disagree with this but generally theology is going to say okay you know you've got this like a evil you got the devil and all these things all these people doing bad stuff but that's not God doing the bad stuff because of free will. But then the teleology seems to kind of contradict that notion because, um, I mean, you could make the argument that, you know, by them acting out their free will, that's how they fit into the plan for these things. Um, but then that's kind of a, I don't know, not a very satisfactory answer, at least for me. But I think if you think of this, uh, if you don't just kind of take it for granted, that kind of standard argument about free will, then you should think, okay, well, where exactly is, you know, God or Jesus or the divine complicit in these other things that basically structured the event that 
it was all leading to the crucifixion. And he's basically saying here, oh, well, you need Judas, of course. You need someone to basically betray him so that he gets arrested and actually gets crucified. But then it, it kind of, I think you can kind of extrapolate from that to just about everything in terms of theology to like the very problem of evil. And that, you know, even like the notion of Satan is kind of like, okay, wait, so God made Satan, he was an angel, divine being, and then betrayed God in order to basically kind of seemingly like do his deeds to a certain degree. He's like this necessary figure, like the, he's like the DA. He's like the prosecuting attorney that you need so that God can just be like, yeah, actually, you know, I'm thinking of uh, the book of Job basically where he's like, he's trying to basically present these counter arguments against God so that God can just be like, show that he's right. Essentially. He's basically just another cog in the machine, which makes me think that all these things are basically, this can be basically his hypothesis about Judas can be kind of radicalized and almost universalized so that basically, you know, if one thing is ultimately You're frozen again. This crucifixion, this, where does this begin? Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, can you guys hear me now? I think it cut out. But, um, yeah, you guys can go. I mean, to me, the, the, the first version is the, I don't want to say the least interesting, but it would be the closest to some kind of Christian interpretation of the, of the disciples, the role that they played. Uh, when you look down, this is, uh, when he's talking about the first edition of uh, Christ and Judas, Christus och Judas, Judas, um, Judas's betrayal, and this is more than halfway down, Jude, ergo, Judas's betrayal was not accidental. It was a preordained fact which has its myster mysterious place in the economy of redemption. Okay, and then a little further down, uh, Judas Iscariot was that man. Judas alone among the apostles sensed the secret divinity and terrible intent of Jesus. And I really do think that Borges' use of the word terrible goes back to the original meaning of the word terrible, which is awe-inspiring. And we seem to say, oh, that's a terrible meal. <laughs> it's awful. But then, you know, even think of the word awful, right? Full of awe. And, uh, but I really do think when he uses that phrase, in the terrible intent of Jesus, the word had been lowered to mortal condition. Judas, a disciple of the word, could lower himself to become an infer informer, the worst crime in all infamy, and reside amidst the perpetual fires of hell. But, uh, and then, you know, when, he, when, he, when the author goes further, it's really the second version of Judas, which is the bridge between his first version and the very out there third version of his interpretation of Jesus. I think that... Um... If I could, if I could be so bold, I think that uh, I really liked. Uh, Bor Basically, I just thought I, I read this story as kind of like a. I mean, it, it's it's like what what Chase. It's like a. It's it's not. It's a less intense because I don't have my third eye opened yet like you and some other individuals. But I can't. Certain texts are not as holographic for me as I think that they could be. <laughs> and so this is like a low level holographic text for me. I can see some of the. It's starting to become visible for me, but I can't quite. But a, a part of what I saw, right, was this. It talks about the three versions of Judas, and 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 Ed, you're right that there's this sort of really out there version of Judas, that, which I think that one of the primary forces in this text is Borges saying, "Oh, he had a crazy idea about Judas," and was like, "Oh, I should write a little short story about that." That seems. Oh, I'm going to convey that. That's this is my version of Judas, and now. Now that we are, are in this moment in time, I would actually go one step further, perhaps, if I could create sort of my own interpretation of what I think Judas is. In this, because I was thinking, of, I have, I know religious people in my life. I have some certain people in my life who are quite religious. Very, um, I know so, there's actually 
a lot of people around me, not like around me that I talk to, but near me adjacently, who study like apologetics and shit. And I, to- I am so distanced from, you know, the, the, that school of theology, you know what I mean? And so I imagine, what if I sat down and talked to them and I said, hey, <laughs> I read this crazy idea. I mean, I've got this. <laughs> and they say, oh, yeah, no, tell me about that. And I tell them. And they say, and then, you know, minutes later, they're calling me blasphemous and splashing me with holy water and whatever. I, I worry that that would be the case. So I thought, okay, maybe, maybe there's something here that can be a bit of a reconciliation. That's maybe true already. And, and I think it goes along with this, like, these individuals acting freely, but in a deterministic way. Like, like basically, I think that Judas could be God, right? Judas could be the, the, the fle- God made flesh, right? In order to be sent to hell. But he, they, they, he talks about certain points in here where it's like that Judas wasn't necessary. Like, like Jesus would have been caught. Jesus was going to be, Jesus, Jesus was, a, was, a, was, a, was a criminal. And Judas was just this sort of superfluous betrayal that, that happened to, to kind of, uh, like I said, ratify the, the death, the, the loss, the failure of, of Christ, or I guess the, the, the letting down of Christ by humanity. And, and he says, even on page, on page 98 of uh, the edition that we have, um, on the very top of the page, when he says, he that glorieth, let him glory in the God, 1 Corinthians one thirty one. Judas sought hell. Because the happiness of the Lord was enough for him, he thought that happiness, like morality, is a divine attribute and should not be usurped by humans. Right there, Judas is actively saying, I don't, I don't, I don't have to, you know, I don't have to get Jesus in this way. He's going to get God. You know, the, the, the economy of retribution or, or sacrifice is going to happen. But he sought hell, you know. And, and I think that in that sense, Judas exists as this sort of dialectical opposite to Jesus in the story. These mutually, uh, I guess, necessitating forces of Jesus needing somebody to betray him, even though he was going to get caught. He was just going to get caught and be executed or hanged or crucified or whatever. There was this element in the in the story in the in the notion of their actions that in the face of morality and happiness in God, there needed to be somebody else on the other side being just as much a vehicle and sacrificial lamb for God as Jesus is, but in this sent in the opposite direction so that either one could be anything you know and so maybe maybe I, i'm 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 losing my mind, but I have this inclination or this desire to say that Jesus and Judas are both God. They're both the sons of God, the, 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 the Lord made flesh. You know what I mean? The infinite made finite in some sense, which then retraces its infinity by, by uh, covering the, the swaths of both heaven and hell in a way. And that, that's just kind of poetic, I guess, but I, maybe that's... You, you sound all like Jakob Burma actually talking about the dialectic, but yeah, that's actually almost exactly how I see it is I think a lot of what he's kind of playing with here is this paradox that something kind of turns into its opposite and it's almost like a you don't see it as like a sort of like a Derrida like a absence to give something okay can you guys hear me now Okay, cool. Okay, so basically, you know, Derrida says basically, you know, things aren't just present in themselves. They need some kind of absence to go along with that. I think that's kind of what's going on, but it is also kind of like a Hegelian antithesis that's necessary for like this synthesis, I guess. And I think that also, it, that's kind of this, this central paradox, I think. And he's saying that, you know, if you think about this logic, That means that, you know, A is always not A and vice versa. And that some, you know, we say something about something, it's always the opposite of that. So that, you know, doing the most, you know, uh, 
blasphemous thing is actually doing the most, you know, nobly sacred thing. So he says, yeah, basically, Judas sought hell because the happiness of the Lord was enough for him. He thought that happiness, like morality, is a divine attribute and should not be usurped by humans. So it's basically his seeking, because he was human and not divine, not divine, that's why he chose to try to just totally nullify any kind of divinity. And that's what made him divine. That's what it's saying. And the same, so you see these kind of reflections of opposites there the whole time. And I think that's also going on in the sense of um, trying to put these, then these like divine acts down to just one single thing also doesn't work because it's kind of radically uh, kind of rupturing any kind of limitation to the divine and, and making it kind of reflect on multiple levels. And since, so he talks about um, in this footnote, basically there's this idea, you know, that, okay, what did, was Christ, um, was he crucified just one time in linear historical time? And then that was good enough. And it seems to me what he's saying here is basically, uh, no, actually he was essentially, there's a kind of, you know, timelessness or eternity to that very act itself. He says, basically, so he says to limit what he underwent to the agony of one afternoon on the cross is blasphemous. And then he talks about this. So that he has this French quote and he says, basically, he notes that the crucifixion of God has not ceased for what has happened once in time is repeated ceaselessly in eternity. So he goes on and ultimately says, uh, okay, this made up scholar in order to justify this affirmation invokes the last chapter of the first volume of Haldick's Vindication of Eternity from the we just wow. read. So intertextual holographic text right there in the line about how basically the crucifixion of God is not ceased for what has happened once in time is repeated endlessly, repeated ceaselessly in eternity. So there's that kind of the whole and the part again that's due kind of with this cyclical repetition, but also with eternity in a sense. So it's kind of this, these conjunctions of opposites that I think he's trying to get at in a sense. Well, I, I think you've somewhat flowed from the second version to the third version, because in the second version, and I'm not saying the second version has the clarity of the first or the third, but you, you go back earlier, Chase, to the end of the paragraph that you were quoting from, where it's, uh, where it's uh, these varied anathemas had their influence on Runeberg. And then a little further down, um, he says, he then refuted those who maintain we know nothing of the inexplicable traitor. We know, he said, that he was one of the apostles, one of those chosen to announce the kingdom of heaven all those other things, Matthew, Luke, a man whom the redeemer has thus distinguished merits the best interpretation we can give of his acts to get, to attribute his crime to greed is to resign oneself to the basis motive. Runeberg proposes the opposite motive and hyperbolic and even unlimited asceticism. All right. And he says with terrible, and this is, he uses the word again, he doesn't use terrible my memory that often, but it comes up again in this sort of story with terrible lucidity he premeditated his sins judas chose those sins untouched by any virtue violation of trust and betrayal and he acted secret. with enormous humility and so in this version judas is still human right because remember what you you had said judas sought hell because of the happiness of the lord was enough for him he thought that happiness, like morality, is a divine attribute and should not be usurped by humans. So the second version, even if there's a deeper role for Judas, um, it is still one of human agency, human action, um, 
but still acting on behalf of the divine. Does that make sense? I used to wonder, um, you know, I grew up fundamentalist Christian, if the, the greatest sacrifice would not be to do whatever Jesus did, but to spend eternity in hell for the sake of others. And there, there are, um, it seems like there are stories in the Eastern Orthodox tradition that talk about that sort of thing. But, you know, that saying, I will spend eternity in hell so that somebody or maybe all of everybody could spend eternity in heaven, that would be the greatest sacrifice, I think. Yeah, I remember there's a, a case of some woman who drowned her kids in a bathtub because she basically saw them as, uh, you know, innocent uh, angels and basically wanted them to go to heaven instead of growing up and sinning and all that, where they would probably inevitably go to hell. So based off that logic, it seems to make sense that, you know, if this lifetime is just this fleeting, you know, test ultimately, and it's all about where you end up after that, then really the most selfless, sacrificial thing, most Jesus-like thing you can do is sacrifice yourself by going to hell in order for other people to go to heaven. So basically, the, the best thing you possibly do is essentially to kill as many babies as possible before they grow up. That's essentially, I think, the most noble thing you could do from that perspective, which is interesting. So I'll just leave it at that. Uh, yeah, this, and this is kind of separate, but I think it ties into kind of the connection to the, the first story that we read and the fact that, you know, this is obviously kind of about literature and writing and, and what that is. And one of the, the reason why I like Jesus Christ Superstar so much <laughs> is because I think it, it, it puts the story that at least I was told as a kid was true. And then it makes it kind of a fictional story with a lot of interesting elements and two characters that want the best for each other, but end up hurting each other in ways. And, and so when I, when I look at the story that way, I'm able to kind of conceive of it and, and take from it the value that I see in terms of someone writing it, you know, and just imagining this kind of story and, and what can I learn from the interactions between these people and in what ways do I act like Judas and what ways do I act like Jesus? And, you know, I think all of us kind of have uh, certain ideas that, that relate, you know, to Jesus and to Judas, despite them being opposites, they kind of both have this quality of wanting the best for each other and a willingness to do kind of terrible things uh, in, in both the awe-inspiring sense and the, the way we use it to do something divine and new and, and create something, you know? And so I think that that's, that's what's really interesting to me. And what I think this story brings out as well is that it's like, you know, whether or not this happened or whether or not this is reality doesn't matter because when we look at, because reality and fiction aren't too very different anyway, you know, but if we can look at this in, in a, in a fictional perspective, uh, rather than a historical or realistic perspective, we can like learn, I think, about it in a different way and conceive of it in a different way and gain like a lot of different stuff from it. And at least that's been my experience. So, so we're almost out of time. Do we want to spend a few minutes to talk about the last three pages, the sect of the Phoenix? In name checks Martin Boober. So that got kind of cut off for me a little bit. Um, oh, all I was saying is maybe we want to talk about the last story. Oh, okay, yeah. Actually, so I just want to comment on this last quote. Of last, so this part, the second last paragraph says. Drunk with insomnia and vertiginous dialectic, 
<laughs> Niles Runeberg wandered through the streets of Malmo, begging at the top of his voice that he be granted the grace of joining his Redeemer in hell. I just want to say I identify with that paragraph so much that just, I love that. Yeah. I feel Borges is basically, despair. he put it all down right there. Yeah. You're in demonic despair. It, exactly, but it's awesome. Borges has a habit of putting an adjective in front of a noun that you wouldn't normally associate with the noun. It's, it's almost like it would be connected to some other noun. Um, and he did that in the circular ruins, you know, like a malevolent shore or something. I, I don't remember the exact, but it, it was, he used the word malevolent for uh, uh, natural. Um, you know, I was, I was just reading this real short, short story. And um, there's lots of different interpretations, even though it seems like some of them don't make sense. If you take Borges' description of the sect, at face value, but um, in some ways, if, if you look at it, it, it seems like it's a sect that really has been drained of a lot of its beliefs and rituals, if you think about it. And in one way I was interpreting this is Christianity in a lot of countries, all right? That people are nominally Christian right they they know they know the name Jesus and they know the birth narrative right even if they go ha ha yeah right host of angels uh terrified shepherds but they they have you know and they go to church twice a year and so they have the they have a sense of the christian faith or or the christian stories of Jesus in the same way most of us have a sense of Moby Dick even if we've never read the novel and so that that was just one interpretation that I had. I'm not saying it's the only one, but it was one that kind of jumped out at me. Um, if I could just say something, just, I, okay, maybe God is in the room right now, because Ed, at, like, you, I just finished reading Moby Dick two days ago. <laughs> and I well, literally, yes, I wanted to say, like, this reminds me of Moby Dick. <laughs> uh, this very, because Travis brought up a really good point. He said that what you were talking about, that joining these Redeemer in hell was like this, this thing of defiance, you know, this, this act of defiance. And in Moby Dick, Ahab's relation towards, towards the whale and towards the clear spirit, which he screams at on the deck of the boat while it's on fire, he's, uh, he says that it, you're the greatest form of devotion to you is defiance. Your, your, your greatest gift towards earth was the lesson that Jesus is the greatest rebel, that, that, that God's existence is the ultimate radical break, you know, which then gives the individual access to universality, which I think is only furthered by this argument that Judas even had, our, had access to the universal, you know. Wow, uh, I, I need to read Moby Dick now. It's, it's yeah, awesome. It's, it's a crazy book. It's really yeah. good. I've uh, I've seen that a lot of people have written about the the Gnostic themes in Moby Dick as something like that, but I've never heard it articulated in a way that I could understand. So that, that was very interesting. But um, as it, it, which reminds me a lot of Philip K. Dick in the sense that so he talks a lot about this idea of like a as like something coming from the outside that just kind of like punctures through this like other with a capital O like a perturbation in the reality field that comes in and kind of dislodges the normalcy of whatever it is so that yeah that's interesting well I, I may be repeating myself I'm sorry if I am but I uh, after a weird experience at St. John's College in a seminar I had this uh, visceral sense of God as beyond good and evil in and I I didn't well anyway they so the idea was if if God is love and God can do what God did in in the Abraham story Abraham and Isaac and if God can do what he did in in um Job and you know at the end of Job God's answer to Job is you know when Job says why God basically says, because I'm God and you're not. I mean, that's the basic answer. He said, were you, were you there when I laid the foundations of the earth? Were you there? So he just says, I'm God. Hey, 
I'm God. And, and so the sense I had, I mean, and for me, this feels like my sense of God is not that different from the terrible God at the end of this story, you know, the, the blasphemous God, in that if there's a divine, it's, uh, I had this, this sense of the divine as being um, so uncategorizable that you could not categorize it in terms of good and evil, that it is like this divine dynamo of chaos that's just driving things uh, it, it driving, you know, to get a little Bergsonian or, or uh, Whiteheadian, this sort of driving the the energies in the universe, but that you don't, you you could. It's impossible to know why God would do anything that God does, or even know that if anything happens, if it was God or if it was not. And so there, I had a sense of this absolute amoral. Of power that that's driving all the creative forces of the of the universe. But what that means is is that you could never, you know, if you say God is love, that's an absolutely useless statement because every conception we have of love is human love. And if God, if the God of love can do what happened in Job, and if the God of love can command Abraham to kill his own son, then that meaning of love is. It is something absolutely incomprehensible to us. And so, let's see. And all this ever Could you send that to us in an email? Yeah, yeah, I can. Thanks. But anyway, that, that was my sense of, you know, if there's a divine, you, it, you simply cannot count on that divine to do anything, well, for one thing, to do anything, and you certainly can't divine, count on it for a divine providence in the sense of, sense of doing something that is beneficial to me or even to humanity. And um, because, you know, because to, to there, and there, there have been people said things like this, to limit God to, to, good, to good in the sense of human goodness is the, wor is the worst kind of heresy and blasphemy, you know. So if God is radically free, then God can do whatever God's going to do, and we can make zero sense of it. And, you know, if like in Isaiah, the sort of notion of God is, uh, I forgot what the scripture is, but basically God is the, the ultimate other, meaning that God is the incomprehensible, then, um, I mean, I, I think, you know, I, I guess, so my sense was that from the human side, God can often be a monster, but that's just because God does whatever God does, and, and sometimes it makes my life good, and sometimes it makes my life horrible. And I, and you know, the whole idea of will it all work out in the end, I think is just uh, a bullshit um, effort to comfort ourselves. So if there's a God, my conception of God is not that different from the one at this end of the story. <laughs> yeah, I, I sympathize with that a lot. It's the the kind of apophatic aspect of it, that it's, that it's not something that can be, you know, pinned down to these very simple kind of human concepts of good and evil or, or whatever. Uh, so one thing, um, okay, so that link I sent was for a, a podcast, Weird Studies, which is, I, I love a great deal. Uh, they came out the a episode on Bergson today. So I think that's a sign from God, but no. But they also have uh, another podcast about beauty and the nature. And they talk a lot about this idea of like the universe as something aesthetic, kind of like the way that Whitehead uh, saw it. And they make the point that they're talking about the book of Job and they're basically saying like, God's basically, his argument is aesthetics ultimately for the things he does to Job. Basically he says, uh, I created this world. Like look at this world and the, just the the infinite beauty of it that alone is justification and it doesn't have to be beauty in like a very superficial way but i think what beauty really is is a kind of rupture of normalcy in a sense it's kind of like this ecstatic transgression of seeing things in like their true otherness they're, they're, and when you can see that basically that alone is this kind of, um, I wouldn't say made justification, but it's basically like 
what is what the universe or whatever is in itself and it doesn't need justification beyond that because it just is in, in a kind of sense that almost in a way of like a like a child playing it doesn't really need any kind of goal to look forward to or anything like that it just plays to play and i think that's the basis of of the aesthetic to a certain degree and that's you know that's probably why um whatever that guy's name you know didn't need didn't need wrote to write and that was the vindication of these things okay maybe you can hear me now but yeah so i i like that thinking a lot of, of this kind of like apathetic uh theology when you brought up the child playing that you know some things don't need a justification beyond itself i'm remembering that a crucial point in faust where i remember the devil says to faust you know i can show you all the mysteries of the universe and uh i'll own your soul if you i'm not doing it justice but if you ever if you ever not want to leave something you're saying that's something so beautiful and and he shows him everything and faust takes it in stride but then when he sees a young child and the innocence and uh, the beauty of that young child that's, well, okay, that's it for Faust, you know. Uh, but remember what also the, the devil says in Faust. All theory is gray, my friend. The golden tree of life is green. Maybe. <laughs> um, so. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. Uh, I was just going to ask the question about so this the sect of the phoenix i think it's pretty obvious that he's kind of the secret is supposed to be intentionally vague you know but what is this thing that is like the materials are cork wax or gum arabic uh in the liturgy mud is mentioned this is often used as well it seems like if you're going to try to make any kind of a uh a designation you have to, um, you know even in the in Genesis where I believe he uh God Yahweh Jehovah he fashions uh man out of clay I believe and breathes you know the the breath of life into him it seems like those like kind of like raw materials is something like that. So maybe there's some kind of hint there. I, I thought those though were kind of red herrings, especially the gum Arabic. Um, another interpretation I've stumbled over is just simply what he's talking about sex, you know, and, and that how, you know, the initiation seems so, um, you know, esoteric and then it becomes mundane. And, and remember, there's towards the end of it, end of the story, he's, they could not, they could not bring themselves to admit their parents had stooped to such manipulations. Yeah. You know, um, and that, that's, that's one, and, and I stumbled over a, uh, an interview that Borges, uh, that was conducted with Borges, and he, and he, I was surprised he was so upfront usually I thought he'd hide what he meant, but he said, oh yeah, it's, it's just about sex. Hmm. Kind of makes sense. I was, th this reminded me, so, I mean, which is similar, but a little broader, you know, some of the, the early stories, <clears throat> I kept saying that they made me wonder, I wondered if they were just parables of actually this world. So they seem to be, you know, they're, talking about other worlds, but you could, you could see them as interpretations of our, our experience. And that's what I began to wonder about this one and, and exactly that, especially that paragraph that um, Chase was on. So, you know, initiation to the mystery is the task of the lowest individuals, a slave, a leper, a beggar. Um, then the, you've got the, these trivial materials 
And then later in that same paragraph, all words name it or rather inevitably allude to it. Made me wonder if, if again, you know, possibly he was just saying that this is that world and and the uh, we are the disciples of this religion and whether we know it or not and the and that it, perhaps that is the secret is that this is that world and you know at the end of that same paragraph considerable credit is enjoyed however by those who deliberately renounce the custom and attain direct contact with divinity um, which you know, like I say, could be an allusion to, to sex. You know, maybe that's the the real the real interpretation here. But just in general, you know, maybe the secret is is that this is all here. It's it is this reality. The sacred materials are, you know, my hamburger and this pencil and that blob of mud, and here we are. <laughs> that would kind of go along with my idea. As it's my idea, but I don't know. I, supposed to be my idea of Borges' idea, but um, anyways, that, you know, the part in the whole kind of thing, again, of the, the hologram, where basically anything will do, in a sense, if you, as long as you kind of have the right cognitive framing of it, I guess you can say, then these things will work as the secret, or will work as the divine, or reveal something to you. So it's not so much basically um, kind of definite things that exclude others necessarily so much as um, I think just being able to kind of see uh, reflections of other things in something else, uh, especially in a sense of like something infinite, something uh, eternal and those opposite aspects of the temporal or the finite or whatnot. But I see in, I see in this story something of, it seems mostly to be a kind of parody of things more than anything. So I'm not sure. I think it's, it's probably some kind of mix of both, but um, yeah, who knows? It's secret. It's secret. <laughs> Well, anything, anything else before we check out? It's like uh, uh, Travis and Hunter just bailed out. Yeah, I'm thinking tra uh, Hunter may have said something one time about having something scheduled. I don't know what, 4.30 or something maybe. So maybe mm -hmm. that's why. But yeah. We good? Thank you very much. I think so. Okay. Yeah. See you uh, either Friday or Wednesday. Bye-bye. Yep. All right. Don't forget, Chase, you send us that uh, piece of paper you had. Oh, yeah. I yeah. It on, in an email. Okay. Will do. Thank you. And All if, right. I don't know if you guys caught it, but that if um, that occurrence at Owl Creek Bridge is available on Gutenberg, if anybody wants to look at that. It's it's only, it's only not very long. Okay. Bye-bye. All right. See you all. Also, Alex, if you're interested, uh, Beers also wrote another short story called Chickamauga. Uh, he was actually had served for the, on the northern side during the U.S. Civil War. And uh, he actually came up with uh, the Devil's Dictionary, uh, which was a real sarcastic dictionary. So do you know what his definition of war is? No, uh, I've never uh, read anything of this. Okay. War is God's way of teaching Americans geography. <laughs> that was his <laughs> <definition>. <laughs> That's pretty good. Yeah, that gives you a sense of beer. Okay. Was, okay, uh, wonderful. Was, uh, yeah, he was a little out there. That sounds incredibly entertaining. Yeah. Bye-bye.